This lab exercise, we're going to optimize the parameters of an energy balance in order to be able to fit data. We have this temperature control lab device where we have uh, the heater one and a heater two with a temperature sensor one. Okay, that's our temperature one and our temperature two. Um, and so we have, uh, you know, this device and we want to be able to uh, synchronize it with the energy balance, the differential equation. We might have some unknown parameters here. I'm not going to go through all those, but uh, we might estimate, for example, a heater factor one, a heater factor two, and maybe an overall heat transfer coefficient. So those might be uncertain or unknown. You could also add something like heat capacity. Uh, for example, if you wanted to. But for this exercise, we'll just do those three. Okay, so we have our two energy balances, and they're described by these very long differential equations. Let me break it down a little bit for you. You have the accumulation right here on the left. Here's your convective heat transfer to the ambient conditions, radiative heat transfer to the ambient condition. Here is your convective heat transfer to the other device that's right uh, next to it, and also radiative heat transfer to the nearby device. And then you have your heater value, your actual heater, Q1. Okay, and we'll just put an alpha times that, because that's our factor, so that we can have Q1 be, be between 0 and 100%. And then alpha 1 relates the percentage of the heater to the actual watt output, okay, the power output. And then you also have another energy balance equation right here, and that's for heater two. So very similar, just uh, different numbers on it. Okay, so let's go and look at some of the data, just how we did, just with those parameters versus the energy balance equation. Now you can see right here is the energy balance prediction, and it doesn't, it over predicts uh, what the actual temperature one was and so let's see if we can go in and optimize some of those parameters we could move those ourselves and guess and check but let's instead employ the solvers that are in MATLAB or Python to do that for us and see if we can get closer okay so I'm just gonna go through some of the MATLAB and Python code here they're just side by side and we're gonna go through this relatively quickly I just want to give you an overview of some of the code that's available you can download this and play with it yourself if you'd like to. Just go to the address that's listed on the temperature control lab device. Okay, it's just this apmonitor.com slash heat.htm. And if you scroll down, the thing that we're going through right now is the dual heater parameter estimation. Okay, so if you need some uh, data, you can there, you get it from right here. Uh, sample data if you don't have a temperature control lab kit. Uh, again, you can uh, you can get one of these if you just go to the home page of uh, the apmonitor.com slash do. Okay, and uh, if you come down here, you'll also see some code for the MATLAB Python uh, solutions as well. So if you miss something here, don't worry. You can just go and download it. Okay, so the very first thing that we need to do in Python is just import some packages. NumPy, Matplotlib, SciPy, and Pandas. So those all help us with the analysis. In MATLAB and Python, okay, so MATLAB is on this side. We have a, the heat, the energy balance, okay, in both cases. We have defining these derivative values, okay, and then we just return those. And that's what we need for, uh, you know, ODE int uh, in Python and something like ODE15S or ODE23 or ODE45, you know, one of the integrators in MATLAB. So those are the things you need to return. The input arguments for these in Python is just a little bit different. You have the states, those are going to be your two temperatures, and then your time, and uh, on the MATLAB is just time and then x. Those are just swapped. But the parameters are listed afterward, and those are the optional parameters that come in. So let me show you how to simulate these now. In Python, we do it with ODE int, and we have our function, our initial condition, our time, and then there's our arguments. And in MATLAB, you do it with the ODE integrator, 
you have to create an anonymous function in this case because it normally expects just t and x. And then you put your tx here and then your optional parameters off to the right of it. So I'm just stepping through each of these like I'm actually um, running the system. I'm just simulating one step at a time in these for loop to be able to predict. Uh, given the heater inputs, which are going to be fixed, those are read in from the data file, and also the unknown parameters, the u and the alpha values. Okay, then I go down to the objective function. So now I have, uh, I've simulated this, but I also have some data. And what I'm going to do for each of these pairs, I'm going to take the difference of them and square them. And then add them all together, and that's going to be my objective function. Okay, so that just basically takes the, uh, you know, with the parameters as the inputs, simulates those in both cases, and then just calculates the objective function, which is just the squared difference between the measured and the predicted values. So that's the thing that I'm going to try to minimize with my optimizers. So let's go down to, uh, this is kind of the main part of the script for each of them. Okay, we're just loading in the data right here, creating some data structures. We give some initial parameter guess values right there. Now here's where we use our optimizer. Okay, in this case it's going to be fmincon, and in this case it's going to be the scipy optimize minimize. And we declare our objective. Okay, it's just called objective in both cases. We give it our initial parameter values. Now fmincon needs a couple extras that are just, these are going to be empty matrices. Okay, and in here I have method is, uh, is an SLSQP, successive linear sequential quadratic programming. And we also have some bounds that we defined. Those are bounds on our variables. This is a bound on our U values. This is a bound on our alpha one and a bound on our alpha two values. You can also see the lower and upper bounds there. Uh, very similar, uh, but just used just a little bit differently. Okay, and you can also put some nonlinear constraints in there, but those are empty. Now, if you wanted to use some options like change the type of algorithm that you're using, um, you know, you could uncomment this and then uncomment, you know, just get rid of that, and then you'd have some options as the optional uh, arguments there. Okay, and then after we're done, we want to show the final objective value, and so we just call objective with the new parameters p. These are the optimized parameters right here. Okay, optimized parameters. And then what we're going to do is the rest of it is just plotting the solution. So we get our new optimal parameters, and then we just create some nice plots just to be able to visualize how well we did. So let's go to those. And you know, after you run this, you're going to see uh, this kind of plot right here. Okay, so this one was our initial guess. Uh, you can see that uh, you know it over predicted for temperature one, and you can see after the optimization that the two are fitting much better. The red line now is the T1 optimized, and here it is for T2. So you still see some gaps here, and one of the things I wanted just to talk about with this is. Uh, you know, really the quality of the fit not only depends on the quality of the model, but also the quality of the inputs that you gave it, the Q value. So, for example, if Q2 were just zero all the time, it never moved from zero, then we wouldn't have enough data to be able to estimate alpha 2. That was our parameter that's multiplied by Q2. So if Q2 is always zero, you can't really estimate alpha 2 because alpha 2 could be 10 times as much, but it's multiplied by Q2, which is always zero. So it's important to have the right data uh, for dynamic parameter estimation. And, uh, you know, having frequent changes, you know, steps up and down, like is shown here. 
and the right frequency of you know can help us identify models um, that are that have uh, you know the the correct frequency response. Okay. So uh, a couple other things that we want to mention with this is it looks like there's still a gap right here. Now if you zo kind of zoom in on this, you'll see that um, you know when the heater changes, then uh, you know right when the heater changes we see kind of a gap. So what happens is the measured temperature continues up further and cools down, uh, you know, so there's a little bit of a lag or something going on there, a little bit of a delay. You can also see that right at the beginning, just as the heater turns on. Okay, and so what we're doing is we're modeling this. Here's our heater, and then here's our temperature sensor. And we're assuming that they're all at one temperature. We wrote a box around it and we said everything inside that box is at the same temperature. When in fact you have uh, the heater that is a, a transistor and then you have another temperature sensor that's right next to it. And it looks like what's happening is this is actually the temperature of the heater and that might be a temperature of the sensor. And it takes a little bit of time for the heat to propagate over to the sensor. Okay, so in that case, uh, you have something that, uh, you know, the, t the heater temperature is a little bit hotter than the sensor temperature, and it just takes a little while for it to, uh, con you know, by conduction, uh, transfer the heat over to the sensor. Okay, so we're not accounting for that. And so there's a model inaccuracy. We saw we couldn't eliminate just by adjusting some of the parameters of our model. Okay, and then uh, let's go on and answer some of the other questions that are there as well. And, um, okay, so what parameters would be unobservable? Okay, if heater two were inactive during the whole time, we answered that, you might not be able to estimate alpha two. Okay, why if step changes in the heaters that persist before and after another change, not random values at every time point, or more frequent changes. So why do we wanna have more persistent changes? Um, in some cases, we want to be able to estimate a steady state effect kind of as it levels out at a particular value. If we just had the heaters uh, going up and down very rapidly, uh, we may not be able to see uh, uh, as cleanly a steady state uh, gain there, but uh, we should be able to estimate that. Um, you know, computers should be able to pick that out if we have it on enough time to get the heat temperature up high enough, okay? So in general, we wanna have, you know, kind of a mix of maybe fast changes, but also some slower changes in there. A very popular identification approach um, using chemical plants or refineries is the PRBS, a pseudo-random binary sequence. Uh, you can have others that are used, other types of strategies that are used uh, for identification. Okay, to generate data for identification. Okay, and then uh, we just asked about how well does the model fit in steady state, you know, the overall magnitude change as, as well as during the transient response. And we saw that there's some gap there in the uh, transient response that we might be able to take care of by modeling it as a second order system instead of a first order system. Okay, so big picture overview here. We just went through the MATLAB and the Python, you know, showing how to set up the energy balance as a function, uh, be able to solve that, you know, simulate the energy balance, setting it up in the objective function to compare it with the data, and then just some of the scripts to be able to import data into our uh, program and initialize, use the optimizer, and then plot some of the results. Okay, and in the end, we were able to use optimization to help us do the fit for us. And in this case, there were only three parameters, so you probably could have done it yourself. But I think this is a good exercise just to show that we can use an optimizer. And especially when we get to more complicated systems, you'll certainly uh, appreciate the opportunity to be able to use an optimizer to get a solution.